The Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon The Stolen Roadster The auto brakes squealed. The driver of the oncoming car swung the wheel viciously about. For a moment it appeared that the wheels would not respond. Then they gripped the gravel and the automobile swerved, then shot past. Bits of sand and gravel were flung about the two boys as they crouched by their motorcycles at the edge of the embankment. The car had missed them only by inches. Frank caught a glimpse of the driver, who turned about at that moment and, in spite of the speed at which the automobile was traveling, and in spite of the perils of the road, shot at something they could not catch at them and shook his fist. The car was traveling at too great a speed to enable the lad to distinguish the driver's features, but he saw that the man was hatless and that he had a shock of red hair blowing in the wind. Then the automobile disappeared from sight around the curve ahead, roaring away in a cloud of dust. The road hog, gasped Joe as soon as he recovered from his surprise. He must be crazy, Frank exclaimed angrily. Why, he might have pushed us both right over the embankment. At the rate he was going, I don't think he cared whether he ran anyone down or not. The boys were justifiably angry. On such a narrow, treacherous road, there was danger enough when an automobile passed them, traveling at even a reasonable speed. But the reckless and insane driving of the red-headed motorist was nothing short of criminal. If we ever catch up to him, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind, declared Frank. Not content with almost running us down, he had to shake his fist at us. Roadhog, muttered Joe again. Jail is too good for the likes of him. If it was only his own life he endangered, it wouldn't be so bad. Good thing we only had motorcycles. If we had been in another car, there would have been a smash-up, sure. The boys resumed their journey, and by the time they had reached the curve ahead that enabled them to see the village of Willowville lying in a little valley along the bay beneath them, there was no trace of the reckless motorist. Frank delivered the legal papers his father had given to him, and then the boys had the rest of the day to themselves. It's too early to go back to Bayport just now, he said to Joe. What say we go out and visit Chet Morton? Good idea, agreed Joe. He has often asked us to come out and see him. Chet Morton was a school chum of the Hardy Boys. His father was a real estate dealer with an office in Bayport, but the family lived in the country, about a mile from the city. Although Willowville was some distance away, the boys knew of a road that would take them across the country to the Morton home, and from there, they could return to Bayport. It would make their journey longer, but they would have the pleasure of visiting their chum. Chet was a great favorite with all the boys, not least of the reasons for his popularity being the fact that he had a roadster of his own, in which he drove to school every day, with which he was very generous in giving rides to his friends after school hours. The Hardy Boys drove along the country roads in the spring sunlight, enjoying the freedom of their holiday as only boys can. When they had reached a culvert not far from the Morton Place, Frank suddenly brought his motorcycle to a stop and peered down into the clump of bushes in the deep dish. Somebody's had a spill, he remarked. Down in the bushes lay an upturned automobile. The car was a total wreck and lay bottom upward, a mass of tangled junk. Must have been hit in an awful clip to crumple up like that. Joe commented. Perhaps there's someone underneath. Let's go and see. The boys left their motorcycles by the road and went down to the wrecked car, but there was no sign of either driver or passengers. If anyone was hurt, they'd been taken away by now. Probably this wreck is a day or so old, said Frank. Let's go. We can't do any good here. They left the wreckage and returned to the road again, resuming their journey. I thought at first it might be a red-headed speed fiend, said Frank. If it was, he was sure lucky to get out of it alive. The boys gave little further thought to the incident, and before long they were inside of the Morton's house, a big, home-like, rambling old farmhouse with an apple orchard at the rear. When the boys drove down the lane, they saw a figure awaiting them at the barnyard gate. That's Chet, said Frank. I'm glad we found him at home. I thought he might have gone out in the car. It is strange, Joe agreed. On a holiday like this, he doesn't usually stay around the farm. As they approached, they saw Chet leave the gate and come down the lane to meet them. Chet was one of the most popular boys at the Bayport High School. One reason for his popularity being his unfailing good nature and his ability to see fun in almost everything. He was full of jokes and good humor and was rarely seen without a smile on his plump, freckled face. 
But today, the Hardy Boys saw that there was something wrong. Chet's face had an anxious expression, and as they brought their motorcycles to a stop, they saw that their chum's usual cheery face was clouded. What's the matter? asked Frank as their friend hastened up to them. You're just in time, replied Chet hurriedly. You didn't meet a fellow driving my roadster, did you? The brothers looked at each other blankly. Your roadster? We'd recognize it anywhere. No, we didn't see it, said Joe. What's happened? It's been stolen. Stolen? An auto thief stole it from the garage not half an hour ago. He just went in as cool as you please and made away with the car. The hired man saw the roadster disappearing down the lane, but he supposed I was in it, so he didn't think anything of it. Then he saw me out in the yard a little while later, so he got suspicious and the roadster was gone. Wasn't it locked? That's the strange part of it. The car was locked. Although the garage door was open, I can't see how he got away with it. A professional job, commented Frank. These auto thieves always carry scores of keys with them. But we're losing time here. The only thing is to set out in pursuit and to notify the police. The hired man didn't see which way the fellow went, did he? No. There's only the one road, and we didn't meet him, so he must have taken the turning to the right at the end of the lane. We'll chase him, said Joe. Climb onto my bike, Chet. We'll get the thief yet. Wait a minute, cried Frank suddenly. I have an idea. Joe, do you remember that car we saw wrecked in the bushes? Sure. Perhaps the driver stole the first automobile he could lay his hands on after the wreck. What wreck was that? asked Chet. The Hardy Boys told him the wrecked car they had found by the roadside. It had occurred to Frank that perhaps the smash-up might have occurred just a short while before, and that the driver of the wrecked car had resumed his interrupted journey in a stolen automobile. It sounds reasonable, said Chet. Let's go take a look at this wreck. We can get the license number, and that may help us find the name of the owner. The motorcycles roared as the three chums set out back along the road toward the place where the upturned automobile had been seen among the bushes. The boys lost no time in reaching the place, for they realized that every second was precious and that the longer they delayed, the greater the advantage of the car thief. The car had not been disturbed and apparently no one had been near it since the boys had discovered the wreck. They parked their motorcycles by the roadside and again went down into the bushes to examine the wrecked car. To their disappointment, the car bore no license plate. That looks suspicious, said Frank. It's more than suspicious, said Joe, who had withdrawn a little to one side and was examining the automobile from the rear. Don't you remember seeing this car before, Frank? It didn't occur to me until you mentioned the matter of the license plates. I have been wondering if this isn't the same car that passed us on the shore road at the curve, replied Frank slowly. It is the same car. There's no doubt of it in my mind. It didn't have a license plate. I noticed at the time for I wanted to get the fellow's number. And it was a touring car of the same make as this. You're right, Joe. There's no mistake. The red-headed driver came to grief in the ditch, just as we said he would. And then he went on to the nearest farmhouse, which happened to be Chet's place, and stole the first car he saw. The busted car was the one the fellow was running who nearly sent us over the cliff, Joe declared. And it's ten chances to one that he's the fellow who stole Chet's roadster. And he's redheaded. We have those clues anyway. And he went on past our farmhouse instead of turning back the way he came, cried Chet. Come on, fellows. Let's get after him. There was only a little bit of gas in the roadster anyway. Perhaps he's stalled by this time. Thrilling with the excitement of a chase, the boys clambered back onto the motorcycle, and within a few moments, a cloud of dust rose from the road as the Hardy Boys and Chet Morton set out in swift pursuit of the red-headed automobile thief. End of chapter 2